do more, do nothing, do less. Cardiovascular health in older adults, 75 and older. My name is Kevin Overbeck. I am a geriatrician. I practice at Rowan School of Osteopathic Medicine in their geriatrics department. And I have been there since 2007, 2008, uh, depending on how you want to count. I spent the last 13 or 14 years working with seniors. I work at a retirement community, so I'm there several times a week uh, into the evenings. I'm there in the mornings. I'm there for lunch. I'm there for dinner. I feel like I live with them. So I've seen people in independent living and aging successfully and others who beat the odds when they've been given a bad prognosis, they beat it. I've seen how that's done. Others who have had the things that are common with aging falls confusion hospitalizations some of the inevitable decline and um, i know about that too so the average age of my patients is 91 you should always have that in the back of your mind that everything i'm speaking with is is based in science but also in experience because we just don't have uh, a lot of good evidence of what we should be doing with with 91 year olds i have no relevant financial disclosures we're going to be learning about really adults 75 and older we're talking about their cardiovascular health when they're 75 and older, what should we be doing? I want you to walk away with uh, non-pharmacologic strategies to maintain cardiovascular integrity to 100 and beyond. So, you know, the do more, do nothing, do less. One of the parts of your your plan has to be the non-pharmacologic strategies. I feel like sometimes that that takes more work. One of the things that I have that, that you may not have is peers. I have peer pressure. When when I have 100-year-olds, 101-years-old, 102, exercising, the 80-year-olds see that. They see it. They don't hear about it. They see it. And that influences them in a way that, that just talking about it can't. They have to see it. I want you to see it today, too. We're going to employ recommendations from American Heart Association and the ACC with evidence for rate control, stroke prevention, and atrial fibrillation. So everybody's got to walk away understanding how how to manage atrial fibrillation in older adults. And I want you to translate the information from JNC8 and the evidence from Sprint to prescribe and de-prescribe antihypertensive. So if you went to a geriatrics conference and you attended a lecture, you would probably hear the word de-prescribe. There's no doubt that as we age, we need more medications to stay healthy. uh, Younger people take less medicine than older people, right? So as we age, we we need more medication. We should take advantage of those uh, advancements in healthcare that have come out in our time. Don't miss those opportunities. But there will be some age where they are no longer helpful. The risks of those medicines seem to outweigh the benefits. And so I want you to learn when to prescribe and then you know when to de-prescribe medicine as well. I can't just talk about 100-year-olds. I have to, I have to show them. So let's roll the video. I'd, I'd always enjoyed the, the water, and, and when we moved here, and uh, here I found here was this uh, nice, a small indoor pool, uh, why it was just a natural thing. I try to do a quarter of a mile uh, four times a week, and uh, the quarter mile in our 15-yard pool means uh, 15 laps down and back. Just a side stroke, a simple uh, side stroke. I find it uh, easy and comfortable and uh, suits me well. Uh, I started doing this uh, two or three years after we moved here. Uh, so I think it's been about nine years, uh, which would make it uh, at 50 miles a year, make it 450 miles more or less. And see, uh, I do a mile a week. So approximately 50 miles a year. So I started out from here, and I'm somewhere about the western western boundary of Ohio. Yes. Yeah. What would you? What advice would you give to baby boomers? I'm sorry. What advice would you give to baby boomers? Well, <laughs> by all means, keep up the exercises. Of course. It's very fine. We have a pretty good exercise room here, yeah. and it's, it's fine if you use those machines. I, I, I've never gotten into that, and um, so, so I, I just rely on the pool. What would you say to someone who was 70 years old and, and said that they were old? Oh, no. 
Uh, unless your health is bad, there's no reason for that. Uh, not in today's world. Did, when did you start swimming? Like re swimming regularly part of your exercise? What age were you? Oh, well, uh, as I say, that was uh, two or three years after we moved in here. Yes. Uh, we, we moved in in 2007, so yes, I, I was 87. So, so you weren't a swimmer before then? Uh, not in this sort of, sort of regular way, mm. no. I wasn't uh, where, we, where I had easy access to a swimming pool and, and uh, I enjoyed exercise in, in other forms. But, but so, so you picked up swimming, regular swimming, regular exercise swimming in, in your late 80s or yes. 90? Yes. Is when you started. Uh, yes, that, that is truthful, yes. That's the one thing about you, Don, is uh, that I'm impressed with. You know, I'm learning from you. <laughs> yes. You know that. Um, the one thing that I'm impressed with is that you're not afraid to do new things. Well, I've always, you know, as long as I feel physically able, I'm happy to try new things. All right, well, thanks for doing it. We may got to do another one. This was so, this was great. All right, I'd be happy to. All right, thanks. I don't learn as much from doctors as I do my patients, and I think we're all, everybody listening, is about the same. We learn so much from our patients, what they go through, uh, how they respond to medicine, how they don't respond to medicine. Prognosis is a downward trajectory, and we can put in an intervention that makes a difference, that they don't follow what we expect, and they get better when we would have predicted they would get worse. And those are cases to take note of, those successful aging cases. And I always like to start with pre-session questions. 95-year-old community-dwelling female, she's got recurrent TIAs, and she presents to your outpatient clinic. Last week, the daughter observed that her speech was slurred, she's drooping one side of the face, and resolved gradually within an hour of her visit. They did not go to the hospital because of COVID concerns, and a previous hospitalization four months ago for nearly identical symptoms. The patient herself states, what are they gonna do for me? I'm not 95. Her IADL, she's 7 out of 8. She retired from driving, uh, but her daughter does assist with the bill paying. I still write my own checks, is what she says. Her past medical history is uh, uh, estimated 6 lifetime TIAs and 3 this year. Heart rate is 60, blood pressure 160 over 80. Her GFR 58, hemoglobin 11.5, triglycerides 111, LDL 68. Her 2D echo, taken about 4 months ago, showed an EF of 55% with grade 2 diastolic dysfunction. And she underwent a 2-week cardio a monitor. She completed that about three months ago. Sinus rhythm with rare PVCs, occasional PACs, and a few brief runs of SVT. Which one of the following is the best next step in the management of the patient described? Above, this is her active medicine list. Beta blocker, this is not something I usually prescribe, but this is authentic to the case. She is on aspirin, clopidogrel, so dual antiplatelet therapy, amlodipine, valsartan, hydrocortisone, pravastatin, and omeprazole. Which one of the following is the best next step in the management of this patient? Would you prescribe a pick Pixaban, 2.5 uh, twice a day. Prescribe hydralazine. Increase the valsartan hydrocortisone. Perform a Montreal cognitive assessment or consult cardiology to evaluate the candidacy for an implantable monitor. Now, what would you choose? I mean, this is your case. I'm sure it sounds familiar. What's your next step? My next step is to order a Montreal Cognitive Assessment. My first step is uh, the medications, making sure as a geriatrician, it's all about IADLs, ADLs. It's 100% what I do. It wasn't what I did when I feel like when I first started, but the more I learned about what I'm supposed to do and what makes a difference, it's IADLs. Those are my interventions. So what we'd find out in this case is that she, her ADLs are not as, as good. Her, her Montreal Cognitive Test is not as good as we would have predicted from our interview. And we decide that she's making medication errors. Another question, 86-year-old female resident of assisted living. She experiences dyspnea with exertion and fatigue. During CDC and state mandated guidelines, she has a heart rate check multiple times a day. Her past medical history is uh, she's got atrial fibrillation. She's coronary artery disease, diastolic heart failure with CKD stage 3 anemia. Her weight's 150 pounds, 68 kilograms. Her creatinine's 1.1 with a GFR of 50. Pulse ox, 93% of room air. Heart rate ranges between 42 and 55. Hemoglobin, 11.1. Heart rate's irregular, as you would have predicted. She's got bilateral lower extremity edema. And you're there to see her for member dyspnea with exertion and fatigue. She walks with a walker. 
No falls in more than 12 months. Her heart rate on Monday, 52. Tuesday, 48. Wednesday, 57. Thursday, 51. Friday, 45. Which one of the following is the best next step for the management of this patient? Same, same kind of idea. This is the medicine list on the side. It's authentic to the case. Amiodarone, 200 milligrams. Torvastatin, 10 milligrams. Ferrosulfate, ferrosamide, 20 milligrams. Metoprolol. Succinate 25 milligrams daily, apixaban 5 milligrams twice a day, and Senna. Which one of the following is the best next step in the management of this patient? Would you deprescribe metoprolol, deprescribe amiodarone, deprescribe apixaban, increase ferrosamide to 40 milligrams a day, or consult electrophysiology for pacemaker? What would you do? You're seeing a person for dyspnea with exertion and fatigue. We did um, two things. We increased the ferrosamide and we deprescribed metoprolol. First thing we did was deprescribe metoprolol. Decided the heart rate was a bit low. Leg edema persisted. There was still dyspnea with exertion. Nothing was much better. So we, we added the, the ferrosamide and we would see if in a week if they were better. They weren't better. And they're basically about the same. Here's uh, the heart rates. 45 on Monday, 55 on Tuesday, 49 on Wednesday, Thursday, 48, 50. And uh, you, you put the pulse ox machine on. And you see that the, the, the rate is bouncing between 34 and 48 beats a minute. What's the next best step? Would you prescribe the Joxin? Would you deprescribe amiodarone? Would you increase frosamide to 80 milligrams daily? Console electrophysiology for pacemaker sent to the hospital. Um, the term deprescribe actually you know means several different things. It's a sort of a new term, so it means different things to different people, but it mainly means discontinuing a medicine or working towards discontinuing. So taking someone from omeprazole, 20 milligrams a day, if you decide to give them 20 milligrams on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday only, that's deep prescribing. If you take somebody with uh, amiodarone, 200 milligrams a day, and you reduce the dose to 100 milligrams a day, that's deep prescribing. Would you deep prescribe amiodarone, prescribe the joxin, increase the ferrosamide to 80 milligrams a day, console electrophysiology, or sent to the hospital? Well, we ultimately uh, decreased the amiodarone, consulted the electrophysiology. You know, we did both uh, at the same time. Um, by the time they saw a, the electrophysiologist, um, heart rate was consistently in the upper 50s and in the 60s, and the symptoms got better within you know, about two weeks. So amiodarone is a funny medicine. Uh, lightweight individuals, certainly the closer you are to 100 pounds, can, can get away with maybe 100 milligrams, does the, the job of 200 milligrams. An 88-year-old male with systolic cardiomyopathy, an EF of less than 35%, com complaints of fatigue and palpitations due to atrial fibrillation, has a heart rate of 110 to 130. He's euvolemic, his blood pressure is 130 over 70, presently taking carvedilol, 25 milligrams twice a day. Which of the following is the best next step in the management of his heart rate? Really, he's only on that one medicine that, that is relevant. He's on carvedilol, 25 milligrams twice a day. He takes other medicine, but that's all you really need to consider for this case. He's already on carvedilol, 25 milligrams twice a day. Would you prescribe deltiazem? Would you prescribe verapamil? Would you prescribe the Oxen, prescribe amiodarone, consult cardiology. So in this case, uh, probably the best next step is to prescribe the Joxin. Always concerned about prescribing calcium channel blockers in elderly patients, especially if they're in CHF because of the tendency to accumulate fluid. Atrial fibrillation in older adults greater than or equal to 75 years old. And I, when we talk about atrial fibrillation, as I, as I teach medical students, I still remember the cardiologist sitting down with me uh, when I was a third year medical student um, and and I could read that the EKG showed atrial fibrillation, but I just had no idea about management. And when he broke it down to me that there's really three things, there's cardioversion, uh, you know, getting them back into a regular rhythm, stroke prevention, and there is rate control. All of my notes really, no matter what, when I write the word atrial fibrillation, I always write something about what are we doing for stroke prevention? What are we doing for rate control? So we'll start with stroke prevention first. Everything that you see in green is really has the highest quality evidence. Uh, goals of care, and and there's three there's three themes of goals of care. Longevity. The goal is to live longer. So I, I have a patient who's who's got a wedding to go to in nine months, and I don't think he's got a problem making it. But that's that's really his goal is is to make it there, Just keep me alive to, to be at that wedding. About ten percent of conversations that I have fall into a longevity goal. There is a functional goal, which about 80% of patients, I think, fall in, which is to continue or regain their function. They want to maintain, preserve their functions. For some people, there's getting back to their sport. 
And for seniors, uh, maintain their function that they don't want to be a burden or feel that they're a burden. They want to be as independent as they can be. Uh, that's a common theme. So that's a functional goal. And the third is a, a palliative goal, more of a comfort. I'm, I don't really care about tomorrow, but I just want today to be good. So I was with a 101-year-old. She says, I live long enough. And she really got a palliative goal. Remember, the atrial fibrillation increases with age. So it's always, even though we have the most data about you know people in their 50s, 60s, maybe some in their 70s, I mean, it increases with age. We should have the most data, about 80, 90-year-olds, how to manage them. So that's where we have to blend the experience to. Uh, stroke risk increases with age. So stroke prophylaxis has to be a discussion and has to be w well documented in your note. You know Why or why not you're pursuing anticoagulation? I just want everyone to know what my perspective is and that we underutilize anticoagulation in adults 75 and older with atrial fibrillation. There's fear that they're going to have bleeding, that they're going to have side effects, that they're not going to take the medicine correctly. There's fear about cost. There's concern about falls. If falls get the blame, uh, we're not prescribing it because they fall. I think the fall risk is overutilized as a concern. I want you to, to walk away knowing that that's my perspective um, in case it's not clear. These are the clinician concerns. These are the concerns that I have is, is mainly compliance. Again, the I worry about drug-drug interactions, right, and the bleeding risk, that I've had some doctor patients who have bled, who have atrial fibrillation, and they want to know when can they restart their anticoagulation. Our patient that we just saw swimming in the pool, he just turned 102. He is taking anticoagulation. When did he start? Just before turning 100. He, we prescribed it when he was 99. We asked him about his goals of care. We said, you know, what matters most to you? And you know what he did? He did this. And that was the answer. What matters most to him was his ability to think. He wants to do. He wants to be as independent as possible. I feel like he recognizes that we are all interdependent and uh, he's no different than the rest of us. And so he does rely on his daughter for a few things. But the thing that makes him him is his ability to think and write. He's an author, maybe nine, ten books. Turns out about a book a year. He didn't start writing until he was 83. First book was published. Maybe he's 85, 86 years old. Could have been 87. His first book, and now he's putting out about a book a year. So when doctors have atrial fibrillation and they have bleeding and the bleeding so bad that they need a blood transfusion their first question always is when can i restart my anticoagulation they want that protection they recognize that how important the brain is how important their, their memory is makes them who they are makes them them by not having those difficult conversations with patients and sort of saying well fall risk they may be missing out on a, a really important therapeutic interventions i'm going to go back to compliance and that's why the mocha was the right answer for our first case let me go back to it what do you do for this this woman with recurrent tias i said you know i live with these patients you know i don't i don't really live there i mean i've thought about it but, you know might as well just ran out of space there you know i spent so much time there i wonder if i had a bed there if that would make things easier i've had the benefit Benefit of sort of watching people you know go through things so this example here of multiple TIAs and, and I remember this woman and I said these TIAs were happening more frequently first uh, you know one a year maybe skip a year and then then there was three in a year and then next thing you knew um, they're having like one a month we put into place a plan where they where they have someone administer their medicine so that they never miss. And we say to this person who's observing them, we say, you know, they have these these slurred speech recurrent episodes. They're TIAs. We haven't been able to stop them. You're going to see them too. Just know that we're doing everything that we can to stop them. You know, in other words, probably not best to send them to the hospital given their goals of care and previous workup. Three months later, I said, you know, have you ever, you know, saw one of these TIAs? No. Nine months after we put in plan for the medicine administration, have you ever saw one of these TIAs. Now, we have tw almost 24-hour observation. Medicines are administered that they never miss. They never run out and they never fall on the ground. They always get to take the medicine, aspirin and clopidogrel, and they never have another TIA. And that, I promise you, was the very last case of someone having a TIA. And it's not just like, well, you're taking your medicine, right? Because everyone says yes. Doing cognitive tests, I can tell you if you score poor enough on Montreal cognitive tests, normal is a 26, maximum is a 30. But if you're starting to score in the teens, you know, 15, 16, 17 or less, there's a very good chance and maybe a definite chance that you are making medicine errors. The whole effort is not to find a medicine and that works to keep you healthy, but rather that you don't miss medicines, that you don't know you're missing. A uh, man with three hospitalizations that I was with this week, three hospitalizations in two months, and he said he was taking the medicine exactly as prescribed and everything you would think from an interview he was. But when I went and at, to his home and I said, let's see the medicine, 
he was missing key medications. Related to the reasons for the hospitalization, he didn't realize he didn't have them all. If you want to put a dent into readmission rate, uh, hospitalizations, just good health care, you will assess the IADL of medication administration. That means picking up your medicine, make sure they don't run out, refilling them on time. If you drop them, you rec can pick them up off the ground. You can afford them. So she never had another TIA, in case you're wondering. So whenever we talk about anticoagulation, we talk about fall risk. There's this in increase in risk of intracranial hemorrhage over 85, but it's really not statistically significant. When you have a goal INR of less than two um, compared to INRs that are two to three, really it's the same risk of intracranial hemorrhage. When INRs get above 3.5, that's when there's a significant increased risk of intracranial hemorrhage, and really we want to avoid those situations. So being on warfarin, being on anticoagulation, whatever the name is, is an increased risk if uncontrolled, if INRs are above 3.5 regularly. Those are patients that you really should be concerned about their compliance, that they're taking it right, taking it as prescribed, maybe not double doses, triple doses, or they skip doses many times and, and their INR is subtherapeutic, so they call your office, it keeps being 1.5, 1.2, you keep increasing the dose, and then next thing you know, they actually take the dose you prescribed and the INR is through the roof. These are dangerous, dangerous things, and, and the new agents don't protect you from that. They do a little bit with some of the complexity of increasing the dose, but they don't completely protect you from people not taking the medicine exactly as prescribed, running out of it, can't afford it, making it last. And you need to assess whether they're doing it or capable of doing it accurately. I don't have to know it at all because every one of my patients is over 75. All of my patients meet the criteria for the CHADS age criteria, which you get two points. You get two points for just having the age greater than 75. When you get two points... Oral anticoagulants are recommended, so all my patients' oral anticoagulants are recommended. Advancing age is a reason to prescribe these. It's the older you are, the more likely you are to have atrial fibrillation. The older you are with atrial fibrillation, the more likely to have a stroke. I need to get you on these medicines. So when you compare warfarin and aspirin, if we were giving aspirin to patients instead of anticoagulation, we're doing them in disservice. We have this. 2007 study. It's over a decade old. It's old news, but you had people greater than 75 who got an aspirin versus warfarin, and there's no doubt that uh, warfarin was superior. I keep putting the slide in because I want to talk about the intracranial you know, hemorrhage. The warfarin group had 24 total events, 21 strokes, two intracranial hemorrhages. The aspirin group had 48 events, 44 strokes, one intracranial hemorrhage. The sort of output from the article is Look at the double risk of intracranial hemorrhage. You know, do no harm. Prescribing warfarin, you're going to increase the risk of intracranial hemorrhage. Well, these 44 strokes are no prize either, right? We got 21 strokes, which is 44. I don't want any intracranial hemorrhage. I don't want to increase anyone's intracranial hemorrhage, but if I have to play the, play the odds here, I want to prevent the stroke. 44 strokes in the aspirin alone group. And so it's not good enough. We need to use warfarin. Warfarin is superior to aspirin. And what we already know is the DOAX, the direct oral anticoagulant. These medicines are superior to warfarin. So even when we combine uh, with aspirin and we look at some of these, these trials and we pool them all together, as they did here in 2018, one of the risks, one of the concerns is that the DOAX are when used combined with aspirin, there's going to be an increased you know, bleeding risk. And, and there is. But, and so people were saying, well, maybe warfarin would be safer. Here we have a study that's involving seniors. I put the ages here just so you have a sense. It's the average age is 72, 72, 70, 72, right? These are not 91-year-olds. And we see that it still favors when we're using concurrent aspirin. So someone that needs that 81 of aspirin because they have a stent, they have an indication for a 81 aspirin, DOAX are superior to warfarin, even with the aspirin. And we see here, I just look at the, the p-values. Uh, this is a JAMA article, 2019, that showed an association between oral anticoagulants and outcomes. And I look at those p-values, and whenever they're significant, you know, I circle them for you. Direct oral anticoagulants are superior in older adults. The direct anticoagulants, for example, or if we're looking at just bleeding, 367 events versus 714. Any bleeding, 728 versus 1717. So just from a bleeding perspective, it's it's safer from a mortality issue, which is not always the goal, right? We're talking about goals of care. Uh, longevity wasn't a lot of people's goal. Their goal was to maintain their function and their cognitive ability, 
helps us maintain our function. It's all cause mortality. You know, there's a benefit in being in the direct oral anticoagulants and ischemic stroke, 380 versus 770. So Pixaban, that's that seems to be our favorite right now. Nonvolvular atrial fibrillation to prevent the stroke, five milligrams twice a day. If a patient is greater than 80, and most of mine are, and either weighs less than 60 kilograms or has a serum creatinine greater than 1.5, then reduce the dose to 2.5 twice daily. Avoid use GFR less than 25. So we come to Rivaroxaban. It's for non-valvular atrial fibrillation. It's a competitor with Apixaban. It's 20 milligrams once daily with an evening meal with the EGFR greater than 50. If the EGFR is less than 50 or equal to 50, um, 15 milligrams, and you should not use it if the EGFR is less than 30. It's got an increased risk of bleeding as compared to a Pixaban. So a Pixaban is the favorite, but it's twice a day dosing. Rivaroxaban is once a day dosing, and there may be situations in which Rivaroxaban becomes the preferred medicine because it's once a day. We go back to the cases we talked about where the whole thing, the whole issue is supporting the IADL of medication management. Rivaroxaban being one time a day, maybe the person can only afford the care plan financially. It can only be successful if there's a once you know daily caregiver who comes in and gives the medicines. They can't be there twice a day. Or maybe they could be there twice a day, but they can be there morning and lunch, but they can't be there in the evening spaced out enough for a Pixaban. This might be a case where Rivaroxaban is preferred. But full disclosure, American Geriatric Society, they've put out the beers list criteria and Rivaroxaban is listed as a beers list medicine because it doesn't mean don't ever use it. It just means that there are preferred agents and a Pixaban would be one. So this is a screenshot from the actual PDF of the beers list 2019. Increased risk of gastrointestinal bleeding compared with warfarin and reported rates with other direct anticoagulants when used long-term treatment for VTE or atrial fibrillation in adults greater than 75. So atrial fibrillation and rate control. So we covered stroke prophylaxis, but we need to cover rate control if we're going to totally cover atrial fibrillation. That was the other thing the cardiologist taught me was thinking about cardioversion, thinking about stroke prophylaxis, and thinking about rate control. What are you doing for rate control? And so remember green has the best evidence. This is from the AHA ACC guidelines that green has the best evidence. Control ventricular rate with beta blocker or non-dihydropyridine calcium channel antagonist. That's really they're talking about is deltiazem or of course beta blocker. Then the red, this is the other thing. So you read the green, then I would go to yellow and orange, but no, you should really go to red. Red means don't do it. It's like the opposite of green. It means that there's high quality evidence not to do it. Non-dihydropyridine calcium channel. They just told us in the green to use it. Now they're telling us non-dihydropyridine calcium channel antagonists should not be used in decompensated heart failure. Or someone who's coming back and forth to the hospital frequently with, with edema, you're sort of seeing two or three hospitalizations in a period of eight weeks. You really think about what are the calcium channel blockers are they on? Are they retaining fluid in this red box that says don't give it for decompensated heart failure? They say in the green box, give it. In the red box, they say don't give it. And so will you give it when they're stable to control AFib, but when they have volume overload, it's a concern. So let's look at yellow and orange. Heart rate, resting heart rate, less than 80 is a strategy is reasonable for symptomatic atrial fibrillation. A lenient heart rate, resting heart rate less than 110 may be reasonable in asymptomatic patients. So I found this to be super helpful on those cases where you have, you, you know, you put that pulse ox on and you have a heart rate sort of bouncing between high 80s and, you know, touching on 110, but no symptoms, leave them be. Less medicines more in some of the older adults. And so if they're, they're doing okay and they're maintaining their function, they're walking, getting around, they're not deteriorating, not having those falls, then uh, they're doing well, sort of stand back. That's the, the do title of the uh, presentation, do more, do less, the rate control medication. So we talked about beta blockers, atenolol is on there, but most commonly carvedilol and metoprolol are used infrequently propanolol, right? But this non-dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers, I put verapamil there in red, do not use it. Remember the red is good quality evidence that says don't use it. Interesting about its pharmacodynamics and kinetics is that it's got a high first pass metabolism. That means uh, 180 milligrams of verapamil and you are 80 years old, the 180 milligrams goes into your intestine. It's, it's immediately absorbed and goes to the liver for processing. And because of the high first pass metabolism of the drug, 
a lot of it is is metabolized and then after delivery you have the active drug circulating because of the physiology of normal aging the first pass metabolism the ability of the body to metabolize drugs in the liver through the first pass metabolism mechanism is reduced with normal aging everyone has it you have reduced portal circulation you have a reduced ability of the liver to actually process the medicine so by two mechanisms reduced even just the route the vessel that's carrying the metabolism is reduced and so is the actual enzymes the ability to to reduce it and so 180 milligrams of these medicines is, is like 300 milligrams of these medicines are 240. So if you would prescribe 240, then if they're 85 years old, then, then give 180. What I'm trying to say is if you have someone who's been taking this medicine since they were 70 and now they're 85, it's a good time for a gradual dose reduction, de-prescribe. These are medicines that were prescribed for a good reason. You may want to switch them over to tiltatiazem, which doesn't rely as heavily on a first mass metabolism as verapamil. But either way, you really want to be looking. And if you see verapamil in your patient and you see edema, you're really thinking calcium channel blocker might be okay, but not this one. And then you see the joxin and amiodarone, and they're listed in order. So beta blocker first, non-dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers. Second, the joxin third, amiodarone fourth. So this is a slide right from, get another screenshot from an article published in Circulation 2014 that showed the management of atrial fibrillation according to AHA ACC guidelines. But if there's LV dysfunction, so if there is reduced systolic ejection fraction, do not use those calcium channel blockers. Avoid them. They should be telling you to avoid verapamil, but and that dutiazem is a safer option. That's why I'm so, I feel so fortunate to be invited to this cardiology for the primary care provider to try to offer a perspective from from aging and geriatric.